you. No problem. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to what will undoubtedly be the longest 10 minutes of my life. Um, a few years ago, the actor Anthony Mackie, he told me, well, actually, he got it from somebody else, but I, he can't remember who, so we're just going to leave it with Anthony, uh, that our great-grandparents worked the soil so that our grandparents could be preachers, so that our parents could be doctors and lawyers, so that we could be artists. And I love this notion. I love this idea that with all the cells and molecules playing bumper car within and without us, that ultimately, through lines of succession and evolution, that our destiny is art. So hold on to that for a second while I tell you about uh, Thanksgiving I had a couple years ago, um, a family Thanksgiving. I was in Yonkers. Uh, there was a white Jesus on the wall, you know, nary a non-chemically treated hair follicle in sight. And uh, maybe some Republicans, you know, we're not a monolith. And uh, my parents, upon emigrating to the United States from Ghana in the 70s, they had a plan. They had a very specific plan. They were going to have two kids. They were going to move to the richest state in the union. They were going to find the best school district in that, into that, in that state. And they were going to send their kids to school for free from K through 8 while they saved their pennies. And then they were going to enter the New England Private Boarding School Consortium. And then from there, the Ivy League. So I was 13 when my parents uh, took me for my first boarding school interview at the Loomis Chafee School for Boys and Girls. And a very prim, dressed up interviewer asked me, why do you want to come to the Loomis Chafee School for Boys and Girls? And I said, my cheeky 13-year-old self said, I don't. My cheeky 13-year-old self also thought she was Mary J. Blige. Uh, my parents want me to. So, but my parents were persistent and I had pretty good grades, so I got in. And I went, and there I learned about the performing arts and the creative arts, and I finally had an outlet for all of that frenetic adolescent energy. So the narrative in my family was always, this is Nanefia. I'm Nanefia. This is Nanefia. She's going to go to Harvard. She's going to be a doctor. She's going to move to Greenwich, and she's going to marry a nice Oberni. Oberni means white man. And she's going to live in Connecticut. And as I got older, the narrative evolved because I like to talk and perform and had questionable scruples. So it became, this is Nanefia, she's going to be a lawyer. She's going to move to Manhattan. She's going to have a nice job and she may not marry until later in life, but it's okay, it's okay. Never was the narrative, this is Nanefia, she's going to be a creative arts professional and she's going to travel the world and ponder things and ideas and flirt with abject poverty for the lion's share of her 20s. But the time came to apply to college, and my parents were hell-bent on the Ivy League. I was going through a Don Johnson phase, and I was hell-bent on the University of Miami. But I went, kicking and screaming, to the University of, my, of Pennsylvania, and I tried. I, Lord knows I tried. I tried the conventional path. Uh, the first year after freshman year, my summer, I enrolled. I got a very coveted job in a coveted law firm. And every morning was like Tilda Swinton in the first 10 minutes of Michael Clayton, like literally having a coronary right after my morning coffee and right before anybody had really asked me to do anything. So I left the legal field. And after some rumination and, and introspection, I chose art. I made the decision and I chose art. So my parents, my father, God bless him, he said to me when I told him about my decision, well, if you want to be an actor, you have to go to acting school. Me, I'm a chemical engineer, I'm self-taught. He's right, so I went to school. And upon graduating, I hit the pavement. And I think, as a young, you know, dark-skinned actor, my options were limited, but I submitted and submitted and submitted. I did a lot of things for free in those years. I'm, I remember one year in the late aughts, I had it on fairly good authority that a very prominent casting director uh, was very fond of his two French bulldogs. So I went to Petco. I bought the most expensive dog treats I could get my hands on, on credit, mind you, so those dog treats were about $450. And I threw on a hoodie, and I went to his office, and I made an anonymous delivery with a note. Dear Punky and Dharma, I'm looking for an agent. A word from your dad would make all the difference in the world, so please consider it, but no pressure. In the meantime, enjoy the treats. Sincerely, Nana Mensa. <laughs> and I got a call, and it worked out. It was all right. But meanwhile, my contemporaries were on the fast track at Goldman, at McKinsey, Lehman. And 
I realized that I had to diversify, and so I, I, I did anything I could get my hands on. I catered, I worked in a wine store. I realized that rent was zero sum. You either had it or you didn't. If you didn't have it, you might as well drink. So I got a job catering and endured several iterations of the following conversation. Oh my God, you're so funny. Where did you go to school? Oh, I, I went to Penn. Oh my God, Penn State, they have an amazing football program. No, actually, I, I, um, I went to University of Pennsylvania. Oh. Oh my, oh my God, really? Wow, so, wow. Um, is there any way you could check in the kitchen for any more of those wasabi crusted tuna thingies? Those were amazing. And it became clear around this time that I needed to make a change. And surreptitiously, I got a call from the ac actress, Anya Migdal, and she said to me, why don't we start a company? I have an idea for a TV show. And I was like, Psh, what do we know about companies? What do we know about TV shows? But we put our heads together and we collaborated and eventually we founded Adelis Media, uh, which now has a few docu-series and commercials and a, fil a film upcoming under its belt. And now back to that Thanksgiving that I was telling you about, and I got into it with my Uncle George. My Uncle George is a lawyer and a budding philosopher, and he said to me, he said, Nanefia, everybody knows that you are educated, but what do you actually know? And so we went back and forth on this idea, the difference between information and knowledge. And I realized I needed to separate those things from myself. The things that I contained, the information I contained, the things I'd been told that I, read in, that I read in books or sat and heard about in the classroom, versus the things that experientially I knew in an analog, unplugged way. And my quest led me to HAI, which is a New York City-based arts access nonprofit, where they marry artistic New Yorkers to culturally underserved New Yorkers. So it's the idea that you take a Cajun cellist who was trained at Juilliard and sent him into NYU's Clinical Cancer Center to play for chemotherapy patients, or a washboard trio into an Upper West Side nursing home where former lawyers and doctors who are now octogenarians can access the arts and hear live music. And I, you know, seeing these artists connect to their community was inspiring. I mean, seeing a 89-year-old Holocaust survivor leap out of her wheelchair and dance to live music cannot be anything other than inspiring. And I realized that not only was it benefiting the patients or the clients, it was also benefiting the artists. These were artists who recognized in a very unplugged, analog kind of way that they didn't need permission to make their art. They only needed an audience. They weren't waiting for the phone to ring. And so I became fascinated with this idea for myself that I needed to separate the information from the knowledge. And I saw actors, for example, who went into uh, Clara Barton High School in Brooklyn to work with at-risk teens, and they use role play and theater to rehearse positive behaviors, or digital media artists who went into halfway houses for mental health consumers and worked with them in a way that they otherwise wouldn't have an, an opportunity to do because they themselves were you wouldn't have the means or the materials or the, even the know-how to go and take a class on digital media. And so I now knew that I didn't have to wait. I didn't have to wait for somebody to invite me into the, onto the stage or into the rehearsal or performance room, that I didn't know how to make it happen beyond that point. I had the knowledge now, but now how was it gonna manifest? So one summer, I was sitting at my friend Jim's house, and Jim is a director, and he's an editor, and he's a very serious guy. And he said to me, he said, Nana, I think you need to make a movie. And I was like, Pfft. Who's gonna make a movie? Who's gonna make a movie? I can't make a movie. He was like, don't you have a production company? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. And so we started to throw some ideas around and I decided to go ahead and write. So with one eye on the phone, mind you, I was still waiting for Sam Mendes to call. I didn't understand why he wouldn't just pick up the phone already. I decided to write and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I complained and complained and complained because I realized at this moment that the collaboration that you need when you are working in an ensemble is very different than the self-reliance that is just on you when you're sitting at a desk. And this self-reliance for me had been an atrophied muscle. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and complained and complained and complained and finally it was exhausting so I just stopped complaining. And a few months later I had a script. I had a script of a film that is going to be going into production in 2013. And I realized that then I could call on my friends, these friends that I told you about, the banker friends who had entered the circuit right after school, who now they needed to fulfill their artistic destiny. So my film was financed by my community, by my network. 
So now you might be noticing a pattern, the idea of a resistant education. And I realized that so many times people from my network, people from my community had approached me with ideas and I had to be cajoled or convinced. But really, so many of these opportunities happened and they ended up being for my betterment that I had to just stop asking why or how and just say yes. So I surveyed a bunch of artists when I knew I was going to be doing this talk from all over the country and here in the city, and they had myriad ideas on, the, on what makes an artist and what to do to fulfill your art. And they had ideas such as, for example, exploring decentralized networks, you know, Austin, Portland, New Orleans, getting out of, you know, highly saturated, hypersaturated areas like New York and LA, and ex explore, exploring these secondary markets. And they also said, unplug, unplug and check in with your network. You and your friends, you will all rise together. It's the Matt Damon, Ben Affleck kind of paradigm that you work together and rise together. So I will leave you with this. James Baldwin once said uh, that your crown has been bought and paid for. All you must do is put it on your head. And I love that idea. You must foster your friendships and use digital information as a tool to seek analog knowledge. There is no wizard, there's no omniscient being who is going to pick you. You must pick yourself. Wet a voracious appetite for information, both information digitally and analog knowledge, and ascend from the digital to the analog sublime. Thank you for listening. <laughs>